Testing. Hey, there we go. All right. Can you hear me in the back now? I don't have to project. Could you hear me before, by the way? No? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, the video wants to hear me too, yeah. Great, so I'm going to have a memory of this. Fantastic. At least I wore my elephant shirt. Elephants never forget. All right, so as I was saying. Yeah. Apparently, I'm jumping the gun and I'm getting started too quickly. Well, that was my thought. As I said, feel free to interrupt me during the course of this for any purpose, be it questions or telling me to slow down or whatever it happens to be, and I will try not to speak too quickly. So PHP 7, let's talk about that because um, it's coming, it's on its way. Uh, we're not really sure exactly when it's going to land. Uh, we are aiming for autumn sometime, September-ish, maybe as late as November. Um, I'm expecting we won't actually see it until like April, May of 2016, but taking bets, uh, giving good odds, we'll see where that lands. But before we talk about the future, we need to talk about the past a little bit, because some of you are living in the past, and it's time to come into the light. Quick show of hands, how many people actually have sites that are running on 5.3 or older? Um, that doesn't surprise me, unfortunately, because as you can see, 45.8% of sites out there on the internet are running 5.3 specifically, plus another 20 for 5.2, and fortunately a diminishing number beyond that. Um, that means that two thirds of you out there, well, let me, let me get to that, because 5.1, we all know that's dead, it's gone, it's not supported anymore. 5.2, that died a couple of years ago, it's rotting in the field, it, there is no 5.2. 5.3, yes, all you people who raised your hand, you are running a dead version of PHP. It is not supported. I know Lorna said this to you this morning. I'm going to re reiterate it again because it's worth saying. We're not even applying security patches to that anymore. The only person supporting you is maybe your distribution, maybe. Um, if something comes along, and there have been a few CVEs, I'm not going to say which ones they are, uh, you are potentially vulnerable to some bad stuff. Get off of 5.3. Upgrade to 5.4, right? Nope. That one's in the crosshairs. As Sebastian just said in the last talk, uh, by the end of this year, that's not going to be supported at all anymore either. That means aiming for 5.5 five or 5.6. The good news, for all of you 5.3s three, that raised your hand, the upgrade path from 5.3 to 5.6 even is actually really, I'm not going to say painless, but it hurts a lot less than a lot of upgrades do, especially considering it's three minor versions. Um, there are some issues between 5.2 and 5.3. You want to do that kind of gently. But from 5.3 to 5.6, it really, it, it almost doesn't hurt at all. You get big speed improvements. You get access to a lot of new features. There's no good reason not to do it. So whether it's you or your client's site, just grab them by the neck, slap them around a bit, say it's time for 5.6. <coughs> so I already covered this stuff. You know, two thirds is a horrible number to be unsupported. It's an embarrassing number. Um, so. Let's, let's move that forward. Um, I'm going to blow through these because I'm sure Lorna talked about these this morning. Um, there's some cool stuff in these new versions. I use short array syntax everywhere now. I had to run something on my MacBook which had 5.3 on it, and it's like, uh, you know, why do you have these square brackets here? Oh, right, because that isn't supported. I love short array syntax. Um, traits are great for composing classes. I do a lot of C++ work, so I have multiple inheritance. I need a boost here, and I need a, you know, some other class there. Um, not having multiple inheritance, I didn't think it would get in my way, and then it really does. Um, traits kind of let you get around that. And like I said, big speed improvements. There's an actual big chunk of the speed improvement between 5.3 and 5.6 is between 5.3 and 5.4. Your code will run faster. Your, your users will get their pages quicker. You'll have to run less servers. These are all good things. There's no negative on this. 5.6 introduces generators and coroutines. Um, if you come from a Python background, you might be familiar with generators already. Um, they're pretty cool for uh, doing sort of asynchronous bits of code. You can say, all right, go off and do this thing, and um, kind of in the middle of your process, I want you to go and do something else at the same time. It's attention deficit disorder for PHP, and it actually makes for some really good code. That said, 
you're not going to just start throwing everything into generators. The, it, it, is, it is a pick your moments sort of thing, but gosh, the, the handful of times I've needed a generator has just made my code so much simpler, and I've loved it. Um, better Intel support for the U converter stuff uh, because we've got icon, we've got NB string, we've got all these different things. We're trying to sort of corral all the in internationalization stuff into U converter, which is very handy. Um, but everyone here only speaks English, right? Yeah, yeah it's fine. It's no problem. No, we don't need to worry about other languages. Um, little stuff. This is for each syntax. You see this array as list. So if you have like two-dimensional kind of arrays, and you want to be able to get the subkeys out of the arrays that are in your arrays, makes it really easy to iterate these things out. Syntactic sugar, but it's useful, right? Also, faster. I can't hammer that home enough. I'm really a, a speed freak. Um, five six. Variatics and splats. These are so cool. How many people have got at least one call user funk array in their code? Isn't it ugly? Yeah. Isn't it just the, the most disgusting PHP thing that you have ever seen? <laughs> Splat gets you away from that. I'm going to call user func foo with an array of arguments. It's going to unpack those. So the elements of the args array are going to be argument 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or element 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 if you want to be one base. Weirdo. Um, Variatics uh, allow you to avoid those um, func get args. Variatics say, I don't care how many arguments you pass to me, just put them all into this array, and then I can iterate through that or pick out specific elements. It gets rid of those ugly little warts, and that alone is worth five, six to me. Um, beyond that, you can uh, import functions and constants specifically from namespaces rather than only classes, which is just sort of a completeness thing. Um, Debug info I like because sometimes var dumping an object, you get this huge recursive mess when all you really need to know is what are the essential parts of the object? What are the essential bits of it thing? So that's 5.6. 5.6 is the end of the 5 branch. There will be no 5.7, we think. Um, we're pretty sure there's going to be no 5.7. There was a vote on it, and 5.7 was voted down. So moving on to PHP 6, right? PHP 6 was supposed to have been released five years ago. Five years ago. Some of you were still in like secondary school five years ago. <laughs> we had this great idea that we were going to put Unicode support deep into the language. So you don't even have to think about converting to character encodings. You can just uh, write it all natively and it's going to be beautiful and panacea and ah, ah, ah. No. Um, the trouble with that is nobody really entirely bought into it. Like, nobody was saying, this is a problem that, that I need to solve. It was more like, well, academically pure, we need to look like languages like Python or something that always use you know, full in Unicode integration. Um, we need to be a better language. It was well-intentioned, but like the, um, the blossom of XML support that came right before it, it, was, it wasn't driven by need. And PHP is all about being driven by need. It's about the open source process, really, and what a place to talk about open source, right? It's about Rasmus wants to get his resume online and be able to track his visitors. That's what PHP is. That's what PHP has been for almost 20 years. So PHP died purely from lack of enthusiasm. And that's okay. It doesn't need to exist. So, but PHP 6 was enough of a thing. It was in enough people's hearts because a lot of people did put a lot of work into it to try and make it that academically pure thing that we sort of feel like we need to retire its jersey. It's like a football player who's, you know, I, I don't know the right metaphor for this, but <laughs> we need to retire the number. So it's okay. We have until infinity. There's a few numbers left. We can call the next one PHP 7 and no harm done. Although weirdly that was a big argument. <laughs> Who knows why? So what's PHP 7 give us? Well, it's 10 years since the last major version. 10 years. Children have grown up and started programming in this time. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, a lot of these changes that we're introducing in 7 have to do with uh, sort of the internal workings. Nothing you're going to really see as, a, as an uh, end developer of the language. The, uh, what did I want to say at this point? Oh yeah, the, uh, the variable model has been completely redesigned. 
This is a very positive thing because it means that we're about twice as fast as PHP 5.6 was. Let that sink in. But it also means that on any extensions you depend on, like maybe say XDebug or uh, um, any profiling tools, uh, maybe that database connector that you need access to, they're gonna break, so they need to be fixed. Um, we're also adding uh, some things you will see. Return type hints have actually been approved and merged, so you can now say, my function will always return a array, or it will always return an instance of this particular object, which is good for you know, editor integration to make sure your code has a nice clean quality to it. Um, everybody's happy. Little stuff, Unicode escape sequences. We don't need deep Unicode integration. We have UTF-8. Anyone not using UTF-8 as the internal encoding for their application? No, because UTF-8 is the language of the internet. If one system's gotta talk to another and it needs to use something other than ASCII, why would you need to use anything more than American simple code for information interchange? Um, UTF-8 is what you talk. So we're just gonna say, this is good enough in terms of deep integration because this fixes the job. This scratches the itch. This gets something done, and that's PHP's way. Um, but it will yes, it will. Um, 236BA will translate into a four byte UTF 8 sequence. I don't remember the exact bytes off the top of my head. Um, anyone want to guess what 236BA is, by the way? Snowman. No, it is not Snowman. Snowman is in the basic multilingual plane, ergo, you would only have four hexes. It's two something, I forget the exact number, but yeah. So script encoding and internal encoding. We're actually unifying, uh, the question is what about the spo uh, support for script encoding and internal encoding? Um, we're actually gonna unify those into, um, we hope, a single setting. Um, that's not quite settled down yet. Um, there's, it's a little bit too spread out between MB strings notion of, an, of a script encoding versus icons notion of a script encoding, that sort of thing. So we're gonna unify that into a single thing. And um, in terms of these escape sequences, it doesn't matter. Backslash U, curly brace, hex it, and curly brace is always UTF-8. Um, those settings really only matter, gosh, where do they matter? Um, I think they, ma they matter in terms of defaults, I think, to, honestly, I'm not sure. Um, for my applications, because I do write some PHP code sometimes, the script encoding is UTF-8, and I don't have a good reason to change that. Um, but we can look into that, we can figure out why that's used. A uh, few more things, we've got uh, some more in internationalization support through the Intelcar class. Uh, this is mostly introspection kind of stuff. How you translate 236BA into Cantonese for small chicken. Um, if anyone knows my username, Puyita, that's the connection, because Puyita means small chicken in Spanish. Um, coalesce operator, this is sort of like your if set or ternary, except we are actually doing empty checks on the variable. So we say, if request foo is not even set, that's not gonna create an error, it's just gonna say use the default, <laughs> otherwise use the value of request foo. Um, this is a really common pattern, I know lots of people using their code all over the place, so it's really handy. Um, and then some spring cleaning, we're getting rid of a whole bunch of old stuff. Uh, I'll go into the specifics, but like MySQL and eReg are actually gone uh, in terms of bundled extensions. If you're still using the base MySQL extension, then you have some very old code. It's probably time to look at MySQL I or PDO, use some prepared statements. I'm sure somebody's done a discussion of security by now to tell you why that's a really good idea. Uh, because it's a really good idea to use prepared statements. Uh, there are new things that haven't even been agreed upon yet. These are things that are basically on the RFC list. You can get to that URL at the bottom and see the whole list for yourself. It's pretty long. Uh, these are sort of the highlights and some of the more likely to pass things. Um, so grouped namespace using, uh, instead of having to say in this case, use foobar A, use foobar B as C, use foobar C, um, you just say use foobar and then these specific classes, <coughs> functions, or constants within that namespace. And it allows you to do nice grouped importing. Uh, makes your code look cleaner and nicer. Scalar type hints. Can I get a quick applause for scalar type hints? <laughs> so we've had some type hint support in PHP for a long time. You can say function takes an array or an instance of a class or a callable. Um, this completes that picture by letting you type out ints and strings and things like that. The reason PHP hasn't had this for years and years and years is because we can't agree on how it should behave. 
what happens if you call this foo function and the first argument you pass in is a numeric string? Is that really an int or is it a string? Should we error or should we just coerce that to a number? Quick show of hands, who thinks we should be strict about it? An error. A lot of people. Who thinks we should coerce it into a number and just continue? <laughs> Smaller number, that's interesting. Um, but that kind of demonstrates that. Uh, on the internals list, we just can't agree on that thing. And what uh, Andrea Felds has come up with, I think is a very clever approach, is that it will default to coercive, which means it'll just turn that into a number, but you can put a declare statement at the top of a file, so it's on a per file basis, and say um, declare uh, strict params equals true, or something like that, so that for those calls, they are, they are strict. And I think there's gonna be an INI setting for it as well. So on an application level or whatever, you can say, I want them strict. And this is at the call site that that's determined. So foo can be called from one context in a strict mode and in another context in a non-strict mode. Library authors can be really strict but still allow people to call them coercively. Everybody's happily in theory. Uh, we'll see how far that actually gets. Uh, PHP 4 constructors almost certainly gonna go away. Anyone still using PHP 4 constructors in their PHP 5 code? Good, okay. Those, those should be dead. You should be using under, under construct. Uh, native big integer support. Um, if you're on a 32-bit system, you know this problem intimately because fast, past about 4.2 billion, you convert to float, you start losing um, significance in your values. Even on a 64-bit system, you're limited to 16 quintillion. Um, big int will let you go out to an arbitrarily sized integer and it'll actually be treated as an integer everywhere it moves around the system. Uh, this is going to cause, this is going to create um, a need to modify some extensions a bit, but hopefully not too much is the idea. Um, named view code sequences, these will just go with the, you know, backslash u, so you can actually say, I want a snowman here, makes your code easier to read, it's nice. Um, and the spaceship operator, uh, Davey's personal favorite, um, this is sort of similar to the stir comp function, where it'll return negative one if the left hand is smaller, positive one if the right hand is smaller, or zero if they're equal, and I might have this backwards because I always forget. Um, it's the less than, equal, greater than. It looks a little like a flying saucer seen from the side. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, all cool features, I think, and somebody is calling me, seriously? Um, so, what's actually happening on the inside? Because these are the parts that, sorry, these are the parts that really interest me. Um, the stuff that's happening internally is the stuff that I get really excited about. Uh, PHP 5's notion of a Zval or the sort of the, the internal representation of a variable has four units in it. One is to say I'm a particular type, and for that type, here's my value. I'm either a reference or not a reference, and here are my ref counts. Every variable in PHP 5 is ref counted in some way, even if it's a non-reference <laughs> variable. This is our copy on write thing, um, and prevents us from having to duplicate too many things, like if we cut. A equals some string, B equals A. You don't want to have to duplicate that string. This works fine. It works great, in fact. It makes very flexible runtimes. Um, but one of the problems you run into is that when you switch from a 32 to 64 bit system, you have doubled your memory requirement pretty much across the board because you have to store twice as much for every single variable that you're passing around. Um, this also pro causes some problems in how we structure array containers. The way a PHP 5 array works is you've got a bucket which refers to a pointer, which refers to the actual variable. And then uh, indexing that thing means indexing a, a hash table which points to the bucket, well, which points to a linked list of buckets, which point to pointers, which point to variables. These are a lot of layers of indirection and this cause a lot of extra execution time and memory requirements, and that doesn't make anyone happy. So what we did, uh, we rewrote that completely and we said, okay, we're gonna compactify the structure a little bit uh, partially by making some of these variables explicitly 32-bit wide instead of just an int. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to take references out of the zval entirely. We're just going to say this value is of a particular type and if it is something that requires ref counting, like strings, arrays, objects, we're going to make the thing that we point at be the ref counter. But for simpler things like integers, floats, bools, nulls, undefineds, they're just going to reference it directly and we can copy those as we make new values. This allows us to get rid of a whole layer of indirection, which is more memory saving. It also allows us to pack our arrays really tightly. If you have a numerically indexed array of say five elements, 
you can actually just have a zval five long store them right next to each other. Zero, one, two, three, four. This makes your referencing really fast. You don't have to do hash lookups. It makes storage very small. All of these things lead to less memory consumption, less CPU use, and faster results in less time. Fast results in less time, that's an apologist, but never mind. So that's about as deep as I'm gonna get. We're gonna come back up a little bit. So um, hopefully this is not gonna bite anyone in the butt, but this is the most likely cause of backwards compatibility breaks you're gonna run to in PHP 7. And it's called uniform variable syntax. PHP has a uniform syntax, right? <laughs> Nervous laughter comes out of the audience. Yes, PHP does not have a consistent syntax because it grew up organically, it was to scratch an inch, it just gets things done, but you wind up with really inconsistent behavior in certain expressions. Things where usually dereferencing an array is a higher order of precedence than let's say um, uh, resolving a variable variable, unless it happens to be a class property that you're dereferencing, in which case things are backwards. Um, this is because none of us are really great language designers. We just sort of get the job done. Um, so what we're doing is we're gonna say, all right, it's time to, it's time to wash that out. It's time to just say, let's, let's declare a breakage. We've got a nice major version to that. So what you've got here is a few expressions that you might see in code. Um, hopefully not too much variable, variable. Um, too many variable properties, things like that. Their PHP 5 meaning versus their PHP 7 meaning. Um, these are detailed on the uh, RFC page for this, which is wikiphpnet slash RFC slash uniform underscore variable underscore syntax. Um, you can see them for yourself, but um, as you can see, if the meaning changes, then your program flow changes and things can actually break. So hopefully somebody's gonna work on a linter that can look for these sorts of things and warn you about them. Uh, it's certainly easy enough to detect. Do a token get all, run through them, see if you see that pattern. Uh, this is likely to be your only significant BC break. Uh, that's going to cause you headache and sleepless nights. Uh, there are other breaks. I mentioned that the extensions, uh, every extension is going to have to be touched at least a tiny bit because we are removing those layers of directions. We don't tend to deal with zval stars. We're now just dealing with straight zvals. Um, our uh, loop, uh, our array iteration has completely changed, so you're going to have to change those. The good news is that the average simple extension, like a database connector, will either just work or only require a few really easy to follow recipe steps to fix them. Yay. The bad news is, at last check, xdebug, xdebug had at least 18 pages worth of errors on the first compilation unit. So Derek's going to have a very fun time fixing that for PHP 7. Um, it's most likely going to be a whole new project like xdebug 7 or something like that. Uh, you can look at the whole list of things that have been deprecated. Like I mentioned, MySQL, ereg are going to be taken out of core. They still will be available in Pickle, so you can get at them, so no big deal. Um, peerage replace with eval, you probably shouldn't have been using that anyway. Peerage replace callback is your friend. Um, create function, definitely not your friend. Uh, we have closures for that sort of thing. Um, handful of deprecated functions. New by reference is going away, and that's actually kind of annoys me because that's not as benign as a lot, I think a lot of the people who voted for that think it is, but eh, whatever. So, bait and switch time. I've talked a lot about PHP 7, how we got there, and what's changing, and what's not changing. I'm gonna talk about hack a little bit because I think the future of PHP 7 is going to include some pieces of hack. We've already seen that happen, actually. Um, Hack introduced uh, return type hinting and generators and things long before they got into PHP. Um, one could argue they either came from HHVM or they came uh, independently. A good idea is always a good idea. I will tell you return type heads almost certainly were a result of encouragement. And the speed improvements in PHP 7 were almost certainly cribbed slightly from, uh, from HHVM because these they basically mirror our types exactly, um, which is coincidental. So I'm going to talk about a few of those things. Uh, Facebook has this runtime called HHVM. It is a drop-in replacement for PHP. And apart from running PHP code, it also runs something that we call hack code. It's a horrible name. It's hard to Google. I'm sorry. I tried to get it changed several times, but it had too much traction internally. So c'est la vie. Um, what language is that? 
Um, so what is hack? Well, it's type hinting god mad number one. So we've got scalar type hints all over the place, which PHP 7 is working on. Um, return type hints, which PHP has already got now. Um, your properties and constants can be typed. You can create your own new types. Um, you can say, I, I want a type that is a user that is a specifically formatted array. We call that a shape. Um, there's syntactic sugar in there. Um, in the lightning talk yesterday, I don't know if anyone was in it, um, the, the gentleman said that arrays couldn't be typed. They actually can. Um, so I just wanted to correct that. Um, and then there is a static analysis tool. The great thing about the static analysis tool, and you can even use this in your PHP code to a certain extent, is that without having to run your code and make sure that it works right in all possible situations, it's actually going to trace the types all the way through your application and say, hey, this thing from this first entry point file was a string, but you're trying to use it eight includes later as an integer. That's going to fail you. And it's going to warn you about that before you ever reach that point. That's the really powerful part of hack. <coughs> um, so let's look at that. Uh, Really recognizable code looks a lot like PHP. We just have a few extra new types in here. Um, construct returns void, obviously, takes an integer. Easy to read. And then we have this error down here. And that's a horrible color choice. I apologize for that. It says $f arrow add banana. Now, banana is not an integer. You could probably stand it on its end and it looks like a one, but it's still not an integer. So hack is going to look at this and it's going to say foo add expected int foo add received a string. We can tell you exactly what's happening and you know what to fix and you know that this is a problem. This is before you've ever run the code. These are not runtime errors. These are build time errors. It's a developer efficiency thing. Uh, constructor argument promotion, I mentioned in passing. This just takes some of the uh, boilerplate out of your code. You'll notice we are no longer declaring num as a property explicitly. We're putting it down here in constructor and giving it visibility. So when the constructor runs, it is going to declare a private integer on the class and it's automatically going to assign its argument to its value. So you get rid of that ugly boilerplate. Uh, generics allow you to do some type erasure through a class definition. If you are from, come from Java, you've probably seen this. Um, you've seen it to a certain extent in C++ with templates. This is a class whose type of its um, property and the type that's returned by get and the type that's taken by add is determined when you invoke it. So I say I want to new foo one, two, three, this automatically becomes an int specialized foo. If I say new foo 3.14, it automatically becomes a float specialized foo. And uh, you don't have to rewrite the same thing for all the various different types that you're going to use. Uh, collections are specialized arrays. So an array is a great container, right? It can be a vector, it can be a map, it can be a set, it can be all whatever you want it to be. We've got these defined as explicit object types and each of these objects have methods on them. So in have, instead of having to remember, uh, what was it? It was a array map, and that takes a callback, then the map, and then filter is the, the map, and then the call. No, it was the other way around. I can't remember. Um, and that was mimed. I can't remember. Uh, we've got uh, methods on each of these objects. You can just call them directly, and that's really useful. I would love to see some formalized collection objects like these in PHP, because if there's one thing in hack that I really love using, well, it's not this, but this is number two. Um, uh, there are also immutable versions, which are often something that you want to pass around uh, without getting changed. Uh, shapes, I mentioned, these are basically arrays with very specific sets of keys and types. So I've said, I have a user who's got an integer ID, a string name, and an integer age. Anything that doesn't conform to that notion of a user should be an error. So in my get user, I'm trying to pass something back that has an alias. That's an error. In my uh, usage of it, I'm trying to access something called an image URL inside it. That's an error. Again, as you're writing your code and over time you're refactoring your code, you think, oh, I've, I've handled all the places where somebody's trying to uh, get to image URL. It's fine. Save it. Hack comes up and says, no, 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 no. Not so fast. Uh, you don't, you're trying to get something that doesn't exist. You don't have to run your code. You don't have to wait until it hits production to find out this is a problem. Async are the things I really like. Uh, so async is, oh God, how do I even describe this? <laughs> async, in a normal PHP application flow, you hit the start, you maybe process some input, you maybe go to the database, then you start creating some output, and you send it to the browser, right? Pretty typical program flow. And you have to block at each one of those stages. 
You say, I need to get the user's profile information, and I have to get the uh, page they're requesting or whatever. Those will be two separate actions that are block on each other. That is what really slows your program down. More so than the engine that's running your, your PHP code, it's that blocking network activity that really slows you down. What async does, and this is why I really want to get in PHP, because I think this will help more than PHP 7, is it says, all right, you can define these as individual chunks that can be called in parallel. So arbitrarily made up numbers. Left-hand side is a traditional program flow. It's going to take, in this case, 440 milliseconds, because everything's got a block on each other. Right-hand side, using async, you're running in made up numbers 275 milliseconds. They're made up, but they're not atypical. Like a two to one improvement just by paralyzing things that can be paralyzed is a really cool thing. Um, so looking back at the code, this sort of like starts that event loop. Say I've got a vector of things that I want you to wait on. Uh, th these all happen to be network requests. So we're making a UDP get time, we're making a, a curl get and a curl post. When the curl get sends its headers and, and its request, it's gonna pause, then the curl post is gonna send its headers and request and pause, and then the get time is gonna send its UDP packet and then pause, and then it's gonna wait for any one of those to have activity and continue on. This ends up running in a lot less time. So that's async. Um, those are sort of like the core features of Hack, the ones I, I, I care a lot about. Um, let's say you've got a big PHP code base and you want to turn it into hack code. We got a tool for that. It's called the Hackficator, and I love that word. It's nice and long, got a lot of syllables. Um, you give it your code base and you say, guess. Go guess my types. Figure out what things are going on. Well, looking at this, we know these types because these, these are pretty straightforward. They are static types. We know what they are. So we can guess them pretty reliably. But everything else, maybe, maybe not so much at a glance, right? So first pass says, all right, function f most likely returns a foo or a null. Um, the syntax, the question mark means it can be nullable. So it's null or full. And the at is your error suppression, right? It's the thing that says if something goes wrong, don't complain too loudly. We can also say f probably takes an int because all the call sites I see are passing in. So we can make a guess about that. And we continue sort of stepping through that one at a time until they all look good. Um, we run this code in production for a week. If there are errors, it doesn't complain about them because we've got those error suppressions on them. And at the end, we feed the logs back into the hack skater. And the hack skater can say, yeah, everything looks good. Or maybe everything but one thing looks good. It'll take those ats off to make them hard types, and it will let you know which ones didn't check out quite as well as you thought. Um, we eat our dog food. Uh, Facebook's been uh, running the hackificator at various points along, along our history to get more and more things converted, sort of timidly at first, and then with, with more gusto. One of the things you notice on this graph is that these big discontinuities are the hackificator, but the, but the slopes are people noticing the hack code who haven't even been told about hack yet, saying, hey, I like this. This is a good idea. I'm going to make more stuff hack. So there's been a lot of buy-in from people who are actually writing the PHP code, and that's pretty awesome. Um, some other things I'd like to see in PHP, uh, non-static defaults. So if we call the greet function with no parameters, the name is actually going to get its default from a function call. You can do this in HHVM. You can't do it in, in PHP. Uh, lambda sy syntax, oh, I love hacks lambda syntax. I get all excited about hacks lambda sy syntax. Uh, let's take a look at some code here. This is not unusual sort of uh, code for dealing with a array of values that we want to filter or map, right? We've got a callback that says uh, for everybody in the users list, we want to call database fetch by user ID to get the actual user's data. It winds up being a filled up ar array of uh, arrays like this. And then for each profile, we want to say only include it if name is set. So this UID one, we didn't get a value, so we're not going to try and display it. Basic PHP code, right? Let's turn that into short lambdas. It's still the same code, but instead of writing out the closure as function, parameter list, use this variable, return that, we reduce it to just the important part. This is a function that takes a UID, and it returns the results of fetch by UID from DB, which is automatically captured from the local scope. And similarly for filter. 
easier to read as you walk through the code once you get used to the short lambda syntax. Where it really shines is when you mix it with collections. I was mentioning array filter and array map having their arguments in the opposite order, which aggravates me to no end. Because how do you read this at a glance? How do you look at that and say, yeah, that's my input array, and that's the result of that map operation, which happens first, and then the filter operation that happens second? Well, in hack parlance, we have a vector, which has an, a method map, takes a callback, which returns a, a map that you can then filter, which takes a callback. I, I know, yeah, I know the reason why map takes it first and filter takes it second. It still irritates me. <laughs> there, there, there is a logical reason behind it, but I'm, I, I'm not going to repeat it because I, I'm it out of protest. <laughs> uh, there was a Simpsons episode uh, where Homer says, "Just because I don't care doesn't mean I don't understand." Uh, user attributes. Um, user attributes are mostly sugar. Um, if you've used Java, you've seen user attributes before. They have a double at sign. In, in hack, we just use double alligators. Uh, it can be a list of arbitrary strings. Those strings can have values within inside of them. Author, in this case, S. Goldman, comma, clowny, because this is stupid code. Uh, they are detectable by a reflection. Not a huge thing. I think PHP could benefit from it. Uh, it would certainly help with things like mocking and unit tests and things like that. You can say, you know, this instead of having all of your PHP unit tests be simply starting with the word test, it might be all methods that have the uh, test attribute on them. It's a little more formalized. Um, we do, however, use these attributes for some more specific things. Uh, you probably have code out there that memoizes its values. So for a given input, it'll say, have I calculated this before? If so, return that. If not, calculate it now and store it in, in an array. We formalize that into an attribute called memoize. It just makes it easier to write the code because you don't have to write boilerplate. Uh, foldable is like a static memoization. This actually happens at compile time so that it's only ever calculated once for the entire life of the process. Um, this is specific <coughs> to having static inputs though. Um, so like MD5 of an empty string should always be the same value, right? Just calculate it once and be done with it. Uh, null safe method calls. Uh, there are different ways of dealing with, with errors happening during your uh, request. Uh, if you've got a chain of method calls, one of these might fail. Does it throw an exception? Does it return null? Um, if it throws an exception, you have to have this try catch around it to deal with that. If it returns null, you have to test each one as they come in and say, okay, did this return a null or an object? If it's, not, if it's null, continue on. If it's object, make the next call. Um, status, null safe static calls, null safe method calls, sorry, um, just add an extra question mark to your arrow operator to say, only call this if you actually have an instance. XHP I love. Who's done this pattern before? We've got an output of a form that takes uh, dollar underscore git, basically user supplied data, and just throws it straight out of the page. Be honest, because I have done this too, and I will admit to it, who has, who has done this faux pas? Come on, come on. There's, some, there's the nervous hands not wanting to admit it. Yeah. When you first start programming for the web, you make this mistake. It's such an easy one to make. And what happens? Who wants to say what happens here? XSS, good word for it. Um, I actually even demonstrated how you would uh, uh, exploit this. Really easy to exploit. People start stealing cookies. People start uh, getting access to all of your users' data through little CSRF injections, whatever they have to do. Um, I was literally sitting in a hospital bed with um, something like morphine dripping into me because I was, and I was really out of it. Woke up at about two o'clock in the morning. There's an XSS in Japanese search. Um, I was working, working for Yahoo at the time on, on web search. Pulled out my laptop and literally, in about five seconds, yep, there's the vulnerability. How my brain made that connection in the middle of the night on drugs, I'm not sure, but I think I need more drugs. <laughs> they make me a good coder, what can I say? So how could we have avoided that? Well, one of the things that uh, uh, Facebook has come up with is this thing called XHP. It's XHTML for PHP. And not only does it exist in HTVM, it also exists in PHP. We've got an extension out there. You can just load that right up into PHP 5. I'm pretty sure we haven't ported it for 7 yet, but I should probably get on that. Um, this allows you to treat 
uh, HTML tags as first class citizens. Instead of just being a string, you'll notice there's no quotes here. Dollar form equals a form tag, and that has meaning to PHP. Inside the form tag, we have some things that are strings and some things that are tags. The get goes out into a property of that tag. It's not just another piece of string in a long series of strings. It's a piece of data that's gone into the tag, and the tag itself knows, all right, I'm working with that data. I'm going to apply HTML special cards or URL encode or whatever the appropriate thing is to make it safe. This is going to catch 99.99% of your XSS uh, uh, possibilities. There is always that 0.01% because if you give anyone a gun, they will inevitably shoot themselves in the foot. Try to improve your aim. Um, you can also create your own tags. So you can actually use this as a way to separate view and business logic concerns a little bit better. Um, this particular site here has a my site footer on it. And that my site footer can take uh, language to display the footer in. And then the tag itself knows how to compose itself out of other tags or actually just be a complete string of data. This, by the way, is one of those 0.01 places where you can break things. Excuse me. Um, you can reintroduce my favorite tags. The thing that W3C in its, in its infinite foolishness decided to take out of HTML, and that's the blink tag. Um, implement it with a little JavaScript. Job done. Um, so what do you do with XHP? Well, we deliver all the XHTML5 tags with the library. So you just include a thing and you've got access to all of them. But if you want a few more, um, there is XHP Bootstrap. This takes Twitter's Bootstrap library, which is basically a bunch of CSS and JavaScript, and allows you to create your interfaces really quickly and simply in your server side by throwing out a bunch of uh, XHP tags. Um, I don't have URL on there, but it's on GitHub slash Facebook slash XHP Bootstrap, or maybe it's HHP Info for XHP Bootstrap. I'm not sure. And I'm slurring a bit, sorry. So let's say you want to try out hack, and, but you want to keep your escape hatch open. You want to make sure that you can still go back to PHP because, well, maybe Facebook will abandon HHPM the way we did XHProf. Sorry about that, guys. Um, maybe uh, HTGVM is just not stable enough. It's, it's crashing all the time. Sorry about that, guys. Um, maybe your pointy-haired boss just says, no, I want PHP, so give me my code back. We've got the dhack skater. It'll look at your hack code, and it'll just say, ta -ha! here, have some PHP code out of that. We're going to get rid of those collections with our fancy syntax. We're going to map these method calls into regular arrays. We're going to get rid of type hints that don't make sense, and we're going to make code that'll run on PHP. The one exception to that is that async will not, is not dehackificatable. Dehackificatable, wow, it's a record. Um, async is just gonna say there's no equivalent for this in PHP. And again, I, I really love to get async into PHP because I think it's awesome. So what does that mean for the future of PHP? Because you came here to hear about PHP 7. You didn't come here to hear about hack, right? It means we have two runtimes working on PHP. And that's something that we haven't really had in the past 20 years of PHP. There's mostly just been regular PHP. And I say mostly because there have been other projects like Failinger and a few other things that have tried to sort of be the compiled version of PHP or a different version of PHP, but they've all sort of disappeared over time. Um, this sort of um, co-development of the language means that both implementations are sort of friendly racing against each other, right? There's a bit of like, oh, somebody's implemented something, we should probably match that. Or, hey, somebody's faster than us, we should probably speed up. Uh, PHP 7, like, uh, I'm not going to say for sure that it focused on performance because HHVM was on the scene, but it is very con coincidental and convenient. If that is all HHVM does for PHP, then it's done its job because we have something better for it. We all have something better for it. Um, the new syntax, like I said, I don't know how some of you survive on 5.3 because some of this new syntax is so amazing. Um, I can't, I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if Flowers for Algernon is a, is a reference anyone here will get, but it feels like you're just sort of going back into this, this, this dark place. Um, so I, I think the future of PHP looks really freaking bright because we have this, this, this cooperation and this, and this competitiveness. So um, that's it, and I think my time is pretty close.
So um, do people have questions that they were shy about, they were holding on to? I promise I won't make fun of anybody. I will do my best to answer anything you have. Anybody? Am I right? Mm-hmm. So the, the crux of the question largely came down to the, di the divergence between um, the, P the official PHP runtime and the definition of a language and HHVM's definition of language for hack and things like that. Um, and how close are we gonna try to keep together and, and, and continue to support things so that there is one PHP language and not many PHP languages. Uh, the short version of that is that's actually why we have two separate languages. Um, something that may not have shown up quite as clearly is this open tag less than question mark HH. This denotes it as really a separate language. So Facebook can go and throw anything we want into hack and it's not going to hurt our ability to run PHP code because PHP is less than question mark PHP. Um, so let's say as an example that um, return type hints, uh, let's say that the internals group had decided that instead of putting them on the right after a colon, we want them somewhere on the left, like right after the function keyword which was discussed. So what do we do in that case? Well, we update our PHP parser to accept the return types from there, and then we either A, leave the hack parser alone, so it puts them over there, or we say, all right, we're gonna deprecate that and add the, the support and move things around. Um, that's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, but the bottom line there is that having hack as a separate language with separate features doesn't prohibit us from matching PHP. And I personally, because I have you know, I've, I've, I've got dogs in both races. Like I want, I want PHP to thrive and I want HHVM and Hack to thrive as well because of the, uh, the alternatives they provide and the incentives they give to PHP. So in my selfish interest, I wanna keep them as close together and I wanna avoid those divergences. Sorry, was there a hand over there? I can't really see, there you are. That is an excellent question because I should have said something and I didn't. So the question was, can you mix hack and PHP together in the same project, uh, even in the same request? And the answer is yes. Um, so let's say that, um, let's say this was just defining the say hi method with all of its typing in here and it's in a hack file. Can we call that from PHP? Absolutely. When we get to PHP, um, you know, we're in a regular PHP file, we're calling say hi we do need an instance of the map object, which you can still get to with new map. Um, this is probably a bad example since it takes a collection. But yeah, I mean, they, they all exist in the same runtime, the same process space. Um, the specifics of how that runtime's operating is gonna be set on some INI variables, but they're absolutely interoperable. The trouble you run into is when you're trying to run the static analyzer to check all your types. Um, if you've got a mix of hack and PHP code, the PHP code is basically opaque. It doesn't know what types are supposed to go in because nobody's told it. So um, you don't get the same uh, benefit out of running a mixed mode, but you absolutely can run a mixed mode. Um, and I mean, we talked about this uh, hackification process at, at Facebook, somewhere back here. We only converted 10% of our files to hack here. Does that mean that we have a completely separate site that's only hack and 90% site that's running PHP? No, it means they're calling into each other. So it, it was all about gradual typing and gradual conversion. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I, as he was asking the question, I'm thinking I should mention the specification and I completely forgot to. So um, yes, uh, last June, um, I'm not gonna repeat the question because it's more of a suggestion than a question. Uh, last June, uh, we released a specification for the PHP language. In 20 years, PHP has never had a formal specification. It's just sort of like, well, if it runs on PHP, then it's valued PHP. Um, which works great as long as you're on a single implementation of the language. But then of course we have the, uh, the, the evolutionary problems with that of having only one uh, uh, implementation and a lack of diversity and therefore lack of survival. Um, so we uh, actually paid a guy who had worked on the C language specification to sit down and say, figure out PHP. You've got the parsers, 
You can test code. See if you can make sense of this. Um, he went to an insane asylum. Um, no, uh, that actually went okay, but he did sort of have a lot of head scratching moments, um, which usually came to me because I have the experience with the PHP runtime. And I just <laughs> had to say, yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah, if you, if you, yeah, no, sorry, yeah. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of discussions around the office come out like that, um, especially when it's my code that's broken. But uh, yeah, so we, we hired this guy to write a specification for us. Um, he wrote this huge, massive MS Word document, because bless his heart, he wants to write it in MS Word, um, that we eventually released as a set of markdown files, because that's a little bit more open. And they now actually live in the PHP repository, github.com slash php slash, I want to say php-lang spec. And that has since been an evolving document. We've actually branched that for PHP 7, I think, I hope, um, and have been adding all of these things like um, Unicode literal syntax or, or whatever else it happens to be, or, or return types. So there is a formal document for that that's gonna help keep PHP and HTGM close together because we have a formal specification and a formal set of conformance tests to run those against. Um, these was written for PHP so HHVM does not pass all the tests that we wrote for the spec because it's, at this point at least, our job to catch up to PHP, not PHP's job to conform to us. So. So the question about, um, given that XHP is XHTML for PHP, does it get upset if you don't do things uh, like close your tags. Um, it is not HTML transitional, it is XHTML. So yes, you have to close your tags. Um, I had an example, I think of an image tag in there and it did have the forward slash close alligator bracket at the end. Um, yes. <laughs> um, which I think is a good thing to be honest. Oh, uh, along the wall. Okay. Uh, so, the, what is the state of HTGVM in production, basically? Uh, as you can see, Facebook is running HTGVM everywhere. We have been since, um, well, actually, roughly since FOSDEM two years ago, actually. Um, we've been running pretty well. Wikimedia recently switched over, so if you go to wikipedia.org, you are running on HTGVM. Um, that's been for a couple of months now. They saw about a two to one improvement in terms of both response time um, and actually closer to a three to one improvement in terms of uh, CPU load. Um, there are some others which I'm not sure I can name yet because sort of they want to put out their own announcements and say, hey, look what we're doing now and this is why your sites are coming up faster. Um, I would say there are at least three large sites that are running HHVM right now and I do know that they're, oh, I can mention Baidu. Uh, Baidu is a big search engine in China. Um, they actually, so <laughs> in the case of Wikipedia, Wikipedia came to us and they said, hey, can you help us with this migration? We're probably going to run into problems because not a lot of other people are using it yet. So we dedicated an engineer to that. Meanwhile, Baidu is just sort of like, oh, hey guys, by the way, we're using you. <laughs> so um, there's two big ones for you there. And I know there's a bunch of really small ones uh, as well uh, because they like to use hack and stuff. Uh, um, were, were you asking about hack or HTVM? I guess I can answer a hack anyway. So there is, a, uh, there is one public framework, well, two actually public frameworks out there. One's called Titan. Uh, which is entirely hack driven, and another one is called Pocket Rent. Um, I don't know much about them to be completely honest, but I know that they're out there and they're used by at least their project authors. Um, I know that Wikipedia is not using any hacky yet, but I believe they're planning to, um, and I believe that's true of Baidu as well. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think I'm out of time. Thank you.